Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our midweek youth devotion. I'm so glad that you've joined us tonight. I remember when I was younger, my dad would go on ministry-related trips, go out preaching and whatnot. And of course, I remember when he would come home, the excitement and elation that I would feel when he would come through the door for the first time and I would give him a hug and all of that. But I also remember itching with excitement. One of the other reasons I was so pumped up was because he oftentimes would bring home some trinket, some toy, or, or some memorabilia from the trip, from the nation, or wherever he just was. And over the years, I remember him coming home and bringing various gifts. I remember one time he brought home this, uh, this tic-tac-toe game board. It was like instead of 3x3, three three, it was 10x10. 10 10. Basically, it was a game of Connect Four, but in uh, tic-tac-toe form, and it was on a flat game board. I remember one time he brought home from the Holy Land. He went to Jerusalem on a, on a tour with Brother Stone King. I think he was playing accordion in that trip. I could be wrong. Anyway, he brought me home this prayer shawl. It was red. They call it the tallit in Hebrew. And uh, it had this black headband that would kind of hold it in place. And so I remember running around the house with, with that on, <laughs> an honorary Jewish boy, I guess. I also remember there was this one mug, and, and I was reminiscing about some of these gifts, and and uh, there was this one mug that he brought home, and on it, it was a black coffee mug, and it had a logo that said, Mind the Gap. Now, I searched for that coffee mug, and it's probably in storage somewhere. I couldn't find it. But from the same trip, I, I did find this little magnet. This is the logo that I'm talking about, and we'll just leave that there for the devotion tonight. Mind the Gap. It's the slogan, and it comes from the London Underground Railway System. Mind the Gap. It's an audible or visual warning phrase that is issued to rail passengers to take caution while crossing the horizontal and in some cases vertical spatial gap between the train door and the station platform. The phrase was first introduced in 1968 on the London Underground in the United Kingdom. It is today popularly associated with the UK among tourists because of the particularly British word choice, mind the gap. The London Underground uses various styles of trains that have differing floor heights, but they share the same platforms, of course. And the variance creates a vertical step gap on many trains that passengers have to traverse. Also, several of the Underground's platforms are curved, and when a straight train pulls up to a curved platform, of course, as you could imagine, it creates an unsafe void between them. And in the absence of a device to fill these gaps... Some form of visual or auditory warning is needed to advise passengers of the risk of being caught unaware and sustaining injury by stepping into the gap. The phrase, mind the gap, was chosen for this purpose, and it can be found painted along the edges of curved platforms, as well as heard on recorded announcements played when a train arrives at many underground stations. To this day, if you were to go to a London underground train station, you would hear a, an auditory uh, announcement that sounds something like this. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. Right? So tonight, I, I don't want to talk to you about um, underground transportation in the UK. I'm just simply wanting to borrow this slogan for the devotion. And I want to remind all of us about a gap in our lives that we need to be aware of. We need to mind the gap. And here it is. Here's what I want to talk to you you about tonight. Have you ever felt great desire to do something, only to go a few days or weeks down the road and then look back and realize that you never followed through, right? Raise a hand. Guilty. I think we've all been there. It's why the majority of resolutions fall off within the first few weeks of a new year. It's why exercise equipment all too often becomes a laundry drying rack. It's why bookshelves can be occupied predominantly by books that are unread. It's the gap between what we want to do, what we say we're going to do, and then what we end up doing. The gap I'm talking about tonight is the gap between intention and action. Everybody has this gap to some degree. We all have intentions to become better people, whether it's physical or physically or emotionally, relationally, or specifically in our context tonight, to become better spiritually. 
But intentions do not produce the results that we want. Desire alone does not get the job done. Of course, we all know it's action that does. How many times have we felt the rush of inspiration after hearing a sermon from one of our pastors or a visiting minister only to go home and change very little in our lives? How many times have we felt the urge to, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to read the entire Bible. I'm going to do it in three months on an expedited plan. I'm going to read the Bible four times through this year, right? And here we are, five plans and three years later, and we find ourselves stuck somewhere in the middle of Leviticus again. Maybe you've felt a prompting before to witness to somebody or call somebody to give them some encouragement only to shrug it off and become, become occupied with the tasks of the day. I think we all know what it is to feel that, that spiritual pull to, to dig into prayer and to hear God's voice and to become a man or a woman of prayer. But many times that desire is drowned out by many tasks that are on the agenda or by whatever media vice that we gravitate toward. Right? I think it goes without saying, obviously there is this gap between our intentions and our actions. And the goal, first of all, is to just be aware of this gap to be mindful of this gap, and to understand that this is a battle that we all must fight. But our second goal should be to not just ignore the gap after, afterward, but to seek to close that gap and to bring our intentions and desires uh, closer in alignment with what actions we actually engage in. All of the above scenarios that I've just listed, they're often accompanied by intense inspiration and the emotion of desire. But these feelings, as you know, they are short-lived, and they seem to wear off right about the time that we go to start whatever commitment we made, right? So what do we do? What is the answer to this gap? How do we overcome this great divide, this chasm that seems to exist between what we want to do and what we end up doing? Well, let me just say a few things about that. First of all, I want everybody to realize that you're not alone in this fight. Everybody deals with this gap. Everybody wrestles with it. In fact, I read in the Bible about a guy, we talked about him last week a little bit. We call him Paul, the apostle. He wrote the majority of the New Testament, a great missionary, a powerful man of God, right? We celebrate his life. But do you realize that Paul faced this gap even after he was, you know, born again of the water and spirit? He's a missionary. He's He's a, an epistle writer to many churches. He acts as pastor and overseer and mentor. And, and even this guy, this spiritual giant, as we would probably say, this guy faced this gap. And he was very transparent about the, the battles that he faced in this arena. He talks about it in Romans chapter 7. I won't read the whole passage, but let me just give you one verse. He said, and this is New International Version, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not. But what I hate, that's the thing that I do, right? I, I want to do things, but then I don't do them. And then the things that I'm trying to avoid, I end up just gravitating toward them naturally. There's this gap between intention and action. Paul wrestled with it, right? He wrestled with this gap. And he realized, and you can read through it yourself in Romans 7, he realized that this gap is produced because of our flesh. We have a spiritual nature, of course, that continually calls us higher, but, but we are connected, chained to this mortal frame, to this flesh that weighs us down. And your flesh and my flesh, it wars against every spiritual aspiration that we have. He would say in another letter to the Galatians 5.17, For the flesh, it desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. There's this constant tug of war, right, between flesh and spirit that we all have. He said they're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. He said there's this tug of war that causes you to not follow through on the things you want to do. He was open about it, and I'm so thankful that he was. You come back to Romans 7, the, the passage we were just in a moment ago, and he concludes his little dissertation, his little uh, portion of this scripture. And he says, what a wretched man I am. And then he said, who will rescue me from this body, from this flesh that is subject 
to death? Who will rescue me from this body that seems to continually pull me down? And then he gives the answer in verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let me just say this at this point in the devotion. Paul realized what the answer was and where the strength he needed came from. He realized that Jesus is the answer. I would say to you today that the strength you need to overcome this gap, to bring your intention closer to the action, right? The strength you need comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. You will derive whatever power and strength and and encouragement that you need from a relationship with him. We must get to the place where we believe what Jesus said in John 15, that without him, without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Jesus is the answer. Now, that, that's great, that's, that's wonderful, and that's very true, but let me just kind of break it down into a little bit of a practical application before we go tonight. Another solution that I want you to consider, again, maybe a little bit more on the practical side, is to realize that, that we don't have to feel a rush of desire to fulfill and accomplish our goals. So the second thing I want to tell you, of course, yes, Jesus is the answer, But the second thing is don't wait for desire to come surging back in your life when you're going to take a step in the the direction of your goals, right? If I could borrow the slogan from Nike, just do it, just act. It's as if we think that every positive step toward God only counts if we feel emotion and desire accompanying it. And that's just not true. God doesn't give you demerit marks, right? if you obey him when you don't feel like it. Here's the reality. Remember the tears that you wept at an altar when you made that commitment to God to pray, to fast, to witness, whatever, right? Remember those tears? Remember the emotion that you felt? Here's a a newsflash for you. You probably won't cry those same tears when you go to make good on your promise, right? But just do it. I'm reminded tonight of the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 21 about the two sons. And let me just kind of remind you of it. Uh, There was a father, and he asked both of his sons the same question. He said, please come and work in my vineyard for the day. The first son, he said, no, no desire, no commitment. But Jesus said that he repented, and then he ended up going to the vineyard and working for his father that day. Okay, now the second son he immediately responds with this great surge of intention and desire and excitement. He said, yes, Father, I will go and work in your vineyard. But then he got lazy, and then he turned on his Xbox or Nintendo Switch, and and then he didn't follow through, you know. And Jesus asked the question to those listening that day. He said, who did the will of the Father? And, of course, the answer to the question is the first son. The one that didn't have much desire but he followed through with action, right? He didn't want to, he didn't intend to, but ultimately Jesus said it's when we just act on what the will of the Father is, what the will of God is. That's the one who is obedient. That's the one who does what Jesus has asked. And that's the one who is pleasing to him, right? We don't have to want to, but if we will be obedient and if we will do it and if we will say this is good and being obedient and and doing the will of God is good— then, then we will be blessed by that, right? We don't have to want to. So we all have this gap. And I conclude tonight. It's between what I want to do and what I actually do. It's the gap between intention and action. And we all need to mind this gap. And we all need to seek to close this gap. And so in summary, how do we close the gap? Number one, realize that Jesus is the answer. If you're wrestling to follow through, if you feel like you're not a disciplined person, don't just fight it alone. Talk to Jesus about it. Bring it up in prayer and find the strength that you need that comes only from him. Secondly, don't wait for desire to come rushing back, but just act. Just do it. And finally, and this is something I haven't said yet, but let me just encourage you with this. When you're setting a goal, don't bite off more than you can chew. If you want to be a person of prayer, a person of the word, set an attainable goal today and execute it. Because what you need more than anything is some positive momentum. And getting a few small wins under your belt will set you off in the right direction. Let's all mind the gap. Let's all close the gap. Let me pray with you tonight. Jesus, thank you so much for the time that we have had together. I pray that your hand be upon each and every student listening. 
every adult listening, whoever may be. And God, I pray that you would help us to, to, to narrow that gap, that divide between the things we intend to do and the desires we have to take uh, positive steps toward you. And God, between what we actually end up doing, I pray that you'd help us to be people that, that follow through and that, that uh, accomplish things for the kingdom and become stronger, better, uh, closer followers of you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Thank you for the time we've had together. We pray that you go with us. We ask it in your name. Amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you for listening.